The actual battle of Willow Tangy occurred across the Colonel Crawford High School. There was evidence found by a preponderance of musket balls and revolutionary style materials that had occurred in that general area. Was that intentional or worked out? Accidental. It's where, it's where you get a bunch of people together. You know, basically that's where Williamson had decided to stop and regroup. Because at that time, that uh, Caldwell had been wounded in both legs at the Battle of Sandusky. Mm -hmm. So the, you know, the, the Rangers did not follow. But you had those 200 plus Shawnee that did follow along with a few of the Delaware and a few of the Huron slash wine as I prefer to call them. So there was, the, the battle occurred there. But it was very minor. Uh, named accounts say there were up to 200 of the just uh, 489 to 564 troops that were wounded or killed. The numbers from the Battle of Sandusky and the Battle of Olentangy only account for 11 deaths. The other 59 deaths were captured, tortured, captured, killed, or just outright killed when they caught them. <coughs> it depended on their ranks. So the problem you have, you've got, you've got a, a, an army that's ruddy. They're running light. I mean, if you, if, you know, you, you run out the door. If someone comes in your front door and starts shooting, there's not a person in here that will try to knock you out their back door unless they have a rather large gun. And that, that's really not the case then. So in both cases, the monuments don't tell the true location. And you take all that land in between where the Battle of Sandusky occurred and the Battle of Olentangy occurred, that strip of land might be five miles wide if they went back in. Think of the effort it would take to do the archaeology in an area five miles wide from monument to monument. And then you go backwards to their trail, their night camp, where they camped at night. Going across over to the Mingo Bottoms, coming across probably through Fort Lawrence in, in that near area, but that was the trail. It was using Mingo Bottoms to Fort Lawrence, and it went actually west and, it went, and some went down the side of the river and some went up towards Lake Erie and the other ones went down the Miami River in that area. One of the things that that John has mentioned that you know the Crawford made out his will. Well he'd already had three strikes against him before he did that. Number one he was the 13th Virginia. <laughs> Number two he had Williamson with him. Number three and, and probably more important, a Shawnee War Party was returning from southern Ohio and, and the southern part of West, what would be Virginia at the time, and saw him when he was no more than two miles in, into what would be the Ohio country, you know, across from Mingo Lot, Mingo Jones Junction. So he was already done. He was done before, before he even got started. Uh, one, of, one of the interesting things about what I've, I've learned through different research I've found. I have two of my relatives. One was a John Daly, and the other was a was Ambrose Molly, who the first one uh, was a member of the 7th Virginia Regiment of the Line, late in her own Shrey War. He was present at Yorktown. Ambrose Molly was an original enlistee of the 7th Virginia that Crawford had commanded during that period of time. And he was one of the survivors at, of Charleston, of the, uh, basically of the massacre that happened in Charleston with the 7th Virginia. And I guess the 7th Virginia was reorganized later on, I think, with the remnants of what was left of the 3rd, 3rd 4th, and 7th, if I remember right. And on the other side of the family, um, we had three fellows who were involved actually in the Crawford Massacre. And their names were Peter Cornstalk, Blackbeard Cornstalk, and Blackwood Cornstalk. And they were the sons of Cornstalk. <laughs> uh, then one of my great great grandmothers was educated at a Moravian mission in Georgia. She, she was Shawnee Cherokee. So, and uh, in some of the writings that you find, you'll find that you think that you're Delaware, you're Huron, you know, you're Shawnee. 
some of your different groups were the primary groups involved. There were Sock Fox from Indiana, Illinois. There were Kickapoo involved. Ottawa Chippewa. Cherokee. Catawba. There were adopted, uh, a large number of adopted whites into the tribe. There were many, um, what they call Metis, that were involved in it. It just wasn't a smaller group of people. Because what, what this was, was it was the big land grab for the Indian view, because all the land grabs occurred in Pennsylvania, et cetera, and the Delawares were Delaware because that's basically where they came from. They were displaced. You don't look your own mouth, actually. Uh, the different groups that came in here, you know, like had, had been alluded to before, they were buff, they felt they were buffer enough from the colonials, but they were close enough to the British for protection. But they really didn't trust either one of them because you have to realize that early on the British played politics with the French back and forth with their trade goods because this was Ohio country and Ohio country was basically French. And the, the English wanted it. So what they did, there's a fellow named George Grogan who was another one of these surveyor types of that was friends of George Washington. And he was involved early, earlier in this period of time in this area with the trading posts. And what to do, the French were real chintzy with the type of trade goods they had, and they had a higher price on them. The British came in and gave them a, a, a better deal on everything. They got more guns, they got more beads, they got more ribbons, they got more boots, they got saddles, whatever they wanted, they got at a better price. So there was a there was an economic war going on to control the Indians, and it, and it worked for a while. But after a while, it came down, they wanted one thing, the guns. <laughs> and, and not everybody else should get because they both really didn't, the French didn't trust the British, vice versa, and the Indians didn't trust either one of them. So it created, a, there was always this tension that was in here, and that's why you have such a jumbled history in the Ohio Valley for that, for that period of time from the contact times up until uh, the removal acts in here. Uh, one, of, one of the things that at least sites that, I, and especially in mind about counting is important, is that as an archaeologist, you know, I see a lot of sites that are destroyed on a daily basis due to a lot of different reasons. Sometimes they're highway, highways. Sometimes someone just wants to build a house and that kill out there, and, you know, on the farm. Uh, this county has about six archaeological sites that are very significant uh, that warrant some form of investigation. Like I said, Dr. Pratt from Heidelberg is now with uh, Miami University. Uh, did, did some work at Mount Uh There is some evidence from uh, some of the individuals I talked to over at North Robinson where you know, the site of Mount Lola and Tangi is. You know, that deserves a little bit of you know, further investigation. You've got Tarhees Village site. You've got Walker's Trading Post down here. Uh, it's, it's one of the houses, I think it's on 3rd Street, if I remember right. It's Walker's 4th Street. Okay, it's on 4th Street, but that, he, he was the chief of the wine house during that period of time, or later on, actually, more of 1812 period. And uh, there's a good chance, you know, some of his trade goods and some of the material goods that, that he had are thrown out, because in our know, there's a habit of people during that period of time, not to throw their garbage away, we call it window or door spray. <laughs> they just open the window and toss it out, and it's just like an old way, just like a little slope out there outside your house, it's usually buried under the ground. Uh, I've already talked with, well, last, late last summer I talked with one of the county commissioners, and I do have permission to do a, a ground penetrating radar and a magnetometer survey on the line about the cemetery there to determine if, both, what the bounds of it actually are. And also the old mission house, foundation of the house, there's a house would be on one side of that cemetery that shows where it was the original mission house when I had council house. And there's a house built in that foundation, and that warrants some excavation. So there's four or five different areas here that warrant preservation and some excavation and, and testing. And uh, I know one of the things that we do, and I am a, uh, a graduate of Hawking College Archaeology Program, uh, I've also been employed by, the, by my professor, by the college, contract archaeologist to the college for about the last three or four years. I'm currently working on a 1752 French Indian uh, war battle site down near uh, Piqua called Piqua Willie. And 
there's also the rest of the material. They're actually trained at the site where the British incurred very deeply in the French territory. The French politely told the Miami chief there, get them out of here because you're going to get yourself in trouble. After about three or four years of going back and forth, these fellows didn't, uh, you know, didn't pay attention because they were getting a better deal. It's, you know, you're paying me more money, I'll pay attention. You know, I'll just pat you on the back and I'll take your money type deal here. So what happened was they decided on, uh, actually sometime in June to attack them. On June the 21st of 1752, they attacked and they destroyed the entire building site, the trader's compound, you know, all those sort of things. All these material goods are beneath the ground. There's really interesting pieces that come out of that. Uh, I, I called it, John, you call it Port Perry? Port Perry. Okay, Port Perry. Okay, and there's and another place is that even though the actual location of that probably has some, what, Elks Club on the top of it, it has a, quite a bit of road, there's probably a, a number of houses there. There's still enough open ground there to find parts of that stockade. Uh, bindings of the troops there, possibly the buttons to tell what their regiments were. There's still enough area, and sure, there, if all <coughs> is, you have to dig up someone's front yard. Uh, it's been done before in Greenville, and the people have done it there, not only citizens, but the archaeologists have been very respective, you know, of, of people's property, and citizens have been very understanding of what archaeological procedures entail. And, uh, one thing that uh, our group, our Hawking College, you know, I discussed it with, uh, with our uh, archaeological administrator the other day, and our school would be more than happy to, on a uh, voluntary basis, you know, work with the Wyandotte County Historical Society, be the county commissioners, the city council, and the mayor, whomever it be, to, you know, possibly map some of these particular Archaeological features, estimate them, publish them, and show that there's something more to archaeology than a frame of arrowheads in your back in, in, in your back room that you look at once every six months or get them on the wall. And archaeology itself is, to me, it, it's something very, very important because every day everything's getting shoveled away. No one knows. I mean, how many people know whether they did really site has got a house on it now? or a significant site is destroyed. You know, in Pennsylvania, the, uh, there was a, another one of the Floridian villages itself uh, that was totally destroyed by a Chesapeake well in, in, the, in the Marcel Shale. So you've got half of it was bought by the Archaeological Conservancy, which is a group of archaeologists that pull their money and they have different benefactors and we buy property and we save it. Well, you've got the sign that says this is the site of such and such town, Moravian, you know, mission from such and such time. Fifteen feet behind it, you got this ten-acre pad of concrete with four wells. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and that's what's occurring. You know, there there's, doesn't seem to be that uh, level of interest in, in preserving archaeological remains at this time. When they build something like you described the concrete, are they destroying everything underneath it or are they just putting a layer over top? Uh, they dig down. You know, because they've got, they've got to get them to find what their base is, what their, their foundation that you're talking. They're putting hundreds of thousands of pounds of drill pipe and equipment on top of it. And if, if you've got a, a trailer 40 feet long, 10 feet wide, 10, 10 feet mm -hmm. tall, full of sand or water, you know, and they use 7 million gallons of water, and it has to be on site on one time, just 7 million times 8, that's 56 million pounds just in water alone. But uh, one thing is that. There are many people who go out and mail tech. In fact, I was a collector for the majority of my adult life. Uh, I decided to go back to school and get my degree. Uh, back in the, uh, I would say, in the year.